Thank you, Lynn and Alyssa, for being with us today. Um, you guys are here to talk, us, talk to us a little bit about your campaign to be Metro Council President. And I'm hoping that both of you can each start off by just telling a little bit about um, who you are, um, why you're running for re-election or for election. And Lynn, would you mind going first? Not at all. Uh, good morning. Uh, it's nice to see you all today. Uh, my name is Lynn Peterson. I am the Metro Council President, and my background is transportation engineering and planning, uh, as well as having been an elected official in this region for some time, starting out at Lake Oswego City Council, Clackamas County Commission, the first elected chair of Clackamas County, and uh, then moving on to work for Governor Kitzhaber on transportation, as well as Governor Inslee in the state of Washington for several years, running the Department of Transportation for the state of Washington. Uh, I've been here, obviously, at Metro for the last uh, three plus years, and with a lack of leadership during crises facing our region over the last several years, I asked Metro and the council to step up and into that gap. This region needs to be keep this proactive momentum going. We can't afford to slow down or start over. We stood up emergency shelters during COVID in the Oregon Convention Center. We housed Clackamas County fire victims during the fires. We set up the largest vaccine clinic in the state with the three major hospital systems and delivered more than 500,000 vaccines that saved lives. And at one point they were all in the convention center all at the same time, which is a major, a major kudos to the staff there. Um, and the, the new redo of the entire building with a new HVAC system that was able to handle all of that. Uh, we're currently removing more than three tons of trash each day off the streets, vacant land and natural habitats and providing biweekly homeless encampment trash pickup in the state was so happy with what we've been doing that they just gave us $10 million to do even more. We're 75% of the way to our goal of building 3,900 affordable apartments in the region and uh, on track to significantly exceed the promise that we made to the voters on the number of, uh, of apartments. Also on the homeless service measure that we passed, we have in place county implementation plans approved by three levels of oversight and those plans are in motion. The county's accelerated by borrowing against their future revenue, collaborating, collaborating in ways that they had never even considered before. And in the first nine months of the homeless service measure, all possible resources, including the new measure, created 1,600 shelter beds. That's new shelter beds on top of the 2,200 that we already had in the region. 17,000 people have been kept from falling into homelessness with the combined resources, again, of the state, the feds, and this measure and over a thousand people have been placed into housing. The dashboard that everybody wanted is up and running. The tri-county planning body for effective coordination is being seated in the next couple of weeks. And the data sharing and analysis conversations to take the dashboard and accountability to the next level are starting. I have demanded accountability all the way along the way and we stretched every dollar. Metro Council and myself stepped up and into this crisis because it is a crisis we did not do our typical processes. Instead, we acted like it was a crisis and the priority was to accelerate services. I understood I was taking a risk and Metro was taking a risk when we leaned into the space because it was an emergency. Leaders take risks. Mark Haas had a great quote today in Willamette Week. If you play it safe in politics, you won't make any friends, you won't make any enemies and you won't get anything done. I am running to make sure that we continue the mo forward momentum because any pause or slowdown results in harm to people and businesses in this region. Thank you. Thank you. And Alyssa, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your reasons for running? Sure. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be with you today. Uh, I'm Alyssa Pishka and I am running for Metro President. Um, I'm running based on my extensive experience in land use and transportation planning, as well as real estate and economic development. And I'll touch on those and why those are so critical for the foundation of Metro and to move forward. Um, so my land use and transportation planning, I have a master's degree in um, urban planning from University of Kansas, uh, received that in 1996 and came out here directly to Portland. I spent the first portion of my career working in land use and transportation through commercial development. I'm very familiar with all the cities across the region the permitting issues and the cultures that they each have. I then moved into economic development, uh, working at Vancouver, Washington. And there I really developed the skills of collaboration and innovation and really utilizing resources we have. That waterfront project you see today was because of my work back in 2008, 2009 in the Great Recession. City of Vancouver had a vision to move forward and we 
promised that we fulfilled our role from the public sector to build the critical infrastructure to make that project happen. I can bring those skills forward for Metro. Finally, I'm also experienced in real estate development, uh, working with Leland Consulting, working with developers. That has now um, propelled me into my own business. I have my own consulting business for about four years now. And I most recently led the economic development strategy uh, for the four county region. We just completed that in November of this year. And what was apparent for that? It was a, it was a great process, a learning process. What I learned from that process was I've lived here for 26 years and I have not seen over that time the point we are now with the division between government and the private sector. Um, I think that's translated clearly in my opponent's handling of the transportation bond measure that failed and the current ongoing frustrations with how the homeless service bond is being implemented. So what I have built my career and experience doing is working with both sides of the table, public and private sector. I believe it's critical to bring both of those parties together, listen to all perspectives so that we can move forward. Based on that philosophy, I've been endorsed by several chambers, the Tank Tiger Chamber, Beaverton, Washington County, as well as mayors of Tualatin and Sherwood. I'm also endorsed by the Home Builders Association, NAOP, and Oregon Smart Growth. But what's interesting as well is I've been endorsed by Robert Liberty. And you all may know he used to be former director of Thousand Friends of Oregon and a former Metro counselor. And I think that speaks volumes of the type of diverse perspective and interest that I can bring together to help Metro move forward. Um, I wanna bring this to the role of Metro president to begin leading, listening to all voices and solving issues and problems um, rather than focusing on um, narrow agendas and not seeing immediate results. So that's my, a little bit on my background and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, I wanna start off on, on homelessness, but I just wanna clarify a few things. Um, Lynn, you had listed a, a few things um, about accomplishments. And you were talking about, for instance, the 1,600 new shelter beds. From the dashboard, it looks like that's new and extended beds. So um, a significant number of beds that had been uh, that we're going to lose funding, but we're able to continue to be funding with with SHS funds. Is that correct? Yes, and it's the whole continuum of shelter beds, right? It's severe weather shelter beds as well as winter shelter beds as well as permanent all year round shelter beds it's a totality of shelter beds yes okay and it looks like almost half of them are actually severe winter beds according to the dashboard probably winter and severe yes okay actually more than that would be about uh 11 almost 1200 of those 1600 for 16 uh 1640 would be winter and, and severe well winter or severe weather um secondly the um you talked about um, how many people placed into permanent housing? It's 1,066. Okay. And that also shows that it's majority of other funding as opposed to SHS funding. I think it was, I can't remember the exact number, but that's the totality of all the money in, yes. Okay. I, I, I'm not, I'm forgetting the percentage of what the SHS is, but it's a smaller, obviously, percentage. Um, Okay. Um, and then finally, you were talking about a thousand people placed in permanent housing. Is that oh, right? That's... Or, I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, um, uh, oh, okay. So the thousand were the people who are placed in permanent housing. So is that, um, and so that's like services that were provided to get them into permanent housing? That's the voucher system plus any services that they need. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. And then, and then there was the 17,000. And again, that's oh. in totality. 17,000 people and families that have been kept from going out on the street. And again, that's federal, state, and SHS. And the SHS was, a, I believe, uh, 1,700 of that. Okay. Um, so the SHS portion of, of those is, uh, of that is, is relatively small. It's also um, part of the funding for the shelter beds, and the shelter yep. beds are not permanent necessarily. There's some permanent, uh -huh. and then there's, okay, great. That's Thank correct. you. And, and, it's in a ramp up, right? We're in the nine months of the first year. So uh, the goal was to have at least 5,000 people placed, right? Because before the pandemic, we knew we had 5,000. And that's when the measure passed, 5,000 folks out on the street. 
So the goal is 5,000 people in permanent housing. And so we're already at 1,000. So we're, we're well on our way. Okay. And, and the 5,000, that wasn't part of the measure though. That was not that's included. Part of the, that's part of the plans. To okay. end chronic, to, in order to end chronic homelessness, that's how it was defined. Okay. But that's not part of the measure or in the explanatory statement from what I recall. No, it's part of the plans that were created. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's start there. Um, you know, there's a lot of dissatisfaction with how uh, local governments are dealing with homelessness across the board. Um, uh, you know, in your response to our questionnaire, you said that Metro deserves an A for how it's managed the uh, supportive housing services bond. Um, can you, I guess, first start off by saying what is Metro's vision for ending homelessness and how do you explain the disconnect between what the public sees and in, in how they feel and, and your uh, assessment of Metro's work as, as um, grade A? Yeah, well, we were um, asked to step up and into this in order to get coordination going, right? And, and to make sure that there was oversight over the money that was being raised. So it has been a uh, difficult uh, conversation to have uh, with the three counties, but we have gotten through it and all of the IGAs have been signed in order to have a level of oversight that people expect on the money. Um, and with those IGAs, uh, the required elements of the plans that we just talked about in which we can then hold them accountable to. Um, and I, I know you've read these, um, but the elements of these plans are the analysis of inequitable outcomes, racial equity strategies, inclusive community engagement, priority population investment distribution, the current investments, the distribution of how the money will go out, the access to coordination, the procurement and partnerships, the planned investments and outcomes reporting and evaluation. And so we'll be able to, because their plans, like this is just Washington County's plan. <laughs> I didn't have enough paper to print out all of them, but basically, because um, I'm at home, <laughs> um, the, uh, the, the point is that there is a lot of detail in terms of how the counties will make decisions as they go through the process, um, as with any plan, it, and with it, this problem is that the individuals need specific services, right? And so you basically, you start to lay out the plan of like, here's how we are going to move towards ending chronic homelessness over the next 10 years. And I think that's the, that's the, the hard part for folks is that the visibility of the homeless on the street is only 15% of the problem, right? 85% of the problem are those who are in, two or three families as Mayor Dolan and Cornelius has showed me, right? Living in one unit, whether that's a townhouse or an apartment, um, a lot of folks couch surfing, a lot of folks that are chronically homeless, but it's, they're invisible to the naked eye. So when you're trying to help the totality of the population, it's not just those on the street, although those are a priority. But I guess I don't hear what the vision is, like what are the, uh, are there specific outcomes that Metro has put forward that you can tell the public, this is what you're going to see by the end of year two. This is what you'll see by the end of year five. This is the, the um, these are the performance um, or the, the, the uh, benchmarks that we're aiming for. Um, this is what that, this two and a half billion dollar investment will buy. So each of the counties have come up with their own plans to deal with their own populations. And then the totality of that, the question is, are they on track to end chronic homelessness within a 10 year time period? So yes, those are outlined, but they're outlined by different, a lot of demographics um, in order to do that. And so I think the disconnect is as we talk through this and implement it, the initial discussion with all of these plans was how do we staff up for shelter beds, those permanent shelter beds when it's so hard to site and they're very expensive when we know we need to get people eventually into permanent housing. And so as you've seen, Multnomah County with uh, City of Portland has ramped up the number of shelter beds way beyond what they originally had thought that they would do. Um, and if they've made that a priority and they will continue to make that a priority. Uh, Commissioner Ryan with his Safe Park, Safe Camp initiative is certainly moving that forward uh, as well in order to get, but again, had difficulty citing these things. So it, it's actually cheaper 
and better to get somebody into the permanent housing. But as you point out, it takes longer. But you can't give like a specific kind of scenario to voters to say, this is what we will achieve by this point in time. Well, as I stated earlier, Helen, there at the time of uh, moving into this measure, we knew we had 5,000 folks in totality on the streets uh, in the region. Right now, we know we're at 1,000 people that we've moved off the street. We're getting the point in time counts, right? Which is where we're gonna find out how much, how many more people we have. And then we'll divide that by 10 and we'll be able to give you that, that number. But right now we're actually pretty far ahead of where we thought we would be. If there's 5,000 people on the street and 1,000 have been moved off, we're, we're well on our way to ending chronic homelessness. But again, it takes time. Thank you. Alyssa, can you talk about um, just the supportive housing services measure? And do you feel that Metro is delivering on what was promised? Is it, is it that the public does not have a clear view of just all the, the extra beyond what's visible or is it a fault on, on Metro's part? No, thank you, Helen. I think exactly what the problem is, I think you're asking a really good question that the voters are asking for. What is the vision? What are we gonna do? And I think quickly and clearly, it is the role of the president to convey as a region, this is where we're going as opposed to deflecting to the three counties that are reams of paper, huge plans, and concisely explain what action are we gonna be taking. As president, what I would be conveying immediately, let's invest in interim shelters. We have to stop focusing on just only permanent housing. We have to stop with binary choices and say, let's bring all solutions to the table, interim shelters and permanent housing, both. Second, we're not talking nearly enough about how to get access to these people for mental health and drug addiction services. I've talked to downtown business owners, they're leaving or the ones that are staying are barely hanging on. The people who are struggling on the streets have severe issues, mental health and drug addiction problems. It is not a matter of just permanent housing. We have got to take care of this crisis immediately and start talking about that. And finally, what we're asking about is outcomes. We've heard a lot of different data points, a lot of different plans. What I believe the one data point we should be talking about are less people living on the sidewalks. That is what everyone sees. That is what everyone cares about. It might be a smaller percentage of the population, but is the most challenging issue. That's why it takes the most significant vision and focus. And I think what we need to be looking at as a region, Metro could play a very valuable role in terms of bringing the service providers together. That's not happening right now. The service providers don't meet. They're not talking about what works, what doesn't work. We don't know how many shelter beds in total, what the occupancy is, are people using them or not because of barriers. Let's talk about that and solve these barriers to getting people having to no longer live on the sidewalks. I think the other issue we could be looking at, Gresham has had a very successful model in addressing homelessness. Let's hold that up for the region. Why? Why is that working well? A lot of that is because they are replicating the Rockford, Illinois model, which is one of the best practices in the country to get to functional zero homelessness. Staff there is out every day building relationships with the people who are on the streets. You can't immediately just ask these people struggling to move into shelter. It takes trust and relationships. That's the type of, when we talk about boots on the ground, that's what we're talking about. People who are actually out there talking to the individuals so that we can focus on them and not numbers and data and how, what types of shelters we need to focus on the people on the street, which have very different issues and get them the solutions that they need. That's the vision that Metro could be conveying and it would resonate with the voters as a clear direction of where we're going. So let me follow up a little bit on that because Metro doesn't have any expertise in homeless services. Um, and from the start, they said they would be relying on counties to, to figure out that strategy. How would you see, uh, you know, does Metro have the, the ability to um, take a stronger role in directing where we should be going, that it should be going to, you know, shelters or, um, you know, kind of, uh, driving that investment strategy more? Like what, what would inform Metro in um, so that it could authoritatively take and, and responsibly take that, that role? 
Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. I'm not looking for an expansion of services, right? Everyone, there's a lot of certain, so many service providers right now. I think Metro um, has, used to have a very compelling data resource center, right? Unfortunately, that's been dissolved under the current leadership. Um, I'd like to bring that back and really look at the data again, back to where are we making progress? Where are the communities that are making progress? I think Metro could play a very important role in terms of holding up objective data that could be conveyed clearly to the public as well as the jurisdictions and see where we're making progress. Um, so that would be one role that Metro could play. Again, bringing these providers together, I think that convening role sometimes is undervalued. But really just hearing firsthand, why is it working well in some areas and others, it's not so well. Likely it's gonna be, it's very challenging to help these individuals move. So what are those barriers? Again, going back to that. I think Metro could also play a better role of aligning with the state. How are we gonna get, make sure we get some of that mental health money um, back to our region? What are we doing to build facilities? My understanding is Wilsonville was looking at build, building a 150 bed mental health facility. That didn't happen. How as a region could we come together and make sure that type of facility gets built in our region? It's not just for Wilsonville, it's gonna serve the whole region. So I think those are some of the, the roles Metro could be playing, especially as a leader. And I think as the president, just simply saying, where are we going? What are those clear areas that we want to achieve? And I think, finally, I think what I'd point out, there, there has been an opportunity to use Metro Resources, the Expo Center parking lot, but that's been up for debate for, as, we, as we've seen for a year because of the gravel, con, gravel condition of a parking lot. That does not suggest to me some leadership that's focused on urgency in a crisis. That should be resolved immediately and taken care of to show urgency and care for uh, finding a solution to the homeless crisis. And Lynn, can you respond to that? I saw you cock your head a little bit at the data management que question, but also that as well as the um, request from Commissioner Ryan's office to provide a parking lot for a safe rest, uh, uh, a safe rest village based with uh, people who live in their cars. Yeah, so first let's, uh, there's three things uh, contained and I think what I heard from my opponent. And the first is the lack of understanding that there's a tri-county body that's being stood up to do everything that she has actually pointed out. Um, and so we will be standing that up in the next two weeks. We have agreement on the uh, folks that will be on that, including uh, myself, as well as the three county reps. Um, and it's a very diverse set of individuals that will be on that to look at uh, how do you do the coordination? Uh, how does this get played out? How do we set those up? And where, where is the data? We've got data people who are being put onto um, that Tri-County uh, Planning Committee, which is where I'm very interested in seeing a lot of this play out and get to some of the things that were brought up. Uh, our research center has never been dissolved. In fact, we are bucking it up in this budget in order to achieve things that were uh, disvalued in the prior administration. We were unable to do that during the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic, we are strengthening our uh, research center. There is no way that as an engineer, uh, I would ever, ever not value uh, the data and the role, especially as I worked at Metro 20 years ago, as we built up this very program and I'm very proud of it. So we, we are working very hard to bring back that value of data uh, to this region. Uh, on the expo, actually, it was my idea. <laughs> I called Commissioner Ryan in, in January, as soon as he was uh, sworn in. And I said, I understand you're looking for safe park, safe camp. We've got a couple parking lots. We would love for you to use them. Uh, it was up to him to follow through because it's his program. Uh, when he got back to us, it was within two weeks of the announcement, and it didn't meet the criteria that they had established over the, the six months that they had stood up the program. We're actually having an emergency meeting with Merck now that uh, Commissioner Ryan has his six sites, uh, because Merck, the Metropolitan Exposition Recreation uh, Commission, actually oversees the day-to-day -day operations of Expo and has authority over those parking lots, and we and by we, I mean Commissioner Ryan, Commissioner Hardesty, and myself will be asking Merck for the use of uh, at least three parking lots uh, at the back of Expo, two of which need to be paved, one does not. And Commissioner Hardesty is looking to see whether she can uh, move some money to pave 
those because Metro doesn't have the funds. We're, we're already running in debt for uh, the expo as we come out of the pandemic. Right, but this has been an issue for several months. I mean, why are you coming now with that? Why not go to Merck a long, you know, several months ago? Because Commissioner Ryan had said no, and then he came back and said he was willing to talk about it. Right, he said he was willing to talk about it back in September. No. <laughs> they, they, they had not been able to resolve their internal issues. They had some um, internal issues with the site. Right. They right. They had issues with the fact that there was a gravel lot, but they had asked. They requested a there, separate. There was lot. more than that. There was actually much more than that that I believe your paper reported on in terms of the zoning that they have to resolve, as well as some other issues with um, BES and when does BES need access to that property and how how they need access to it. So they right. had a lot to resolve. And they they had also requested a separate lot and already paved lot at the expo center. Yeah, and they, what the, the request was the parking lot just off the light rail um, station, which was at the front door of the Expo Center, and we have 40 contracts, and those 40 contracts are dependent on that exact parking lot being available. So we would have lost up to 40 contracts. So you would, regardless, you wouldn't support you making that lot available? No. Okay, thank you. Um, Expo, Expo is still operational and moving and, and a necessary part of our region for now. So. Um, we need we need to make sure that we keep moving with that. Let's talk again about. Um, I want to ask you about the decision to go forward with the homeless services measure in May of 2020, because just a few months, like at the end of 2019, advocates had approached Metro, asked you to put it on the November 2020 ballot. Metro at that point said, "We can't. There's too much work to be done." Um, and then shortly after, you reversed course. And you said, let's not just look at November 2020, let's put it on the May 2020 ballot. And um, there were numerous problems in the development. Um, revenue estimates were, were revised significantly down. You had to change kind of what you were looking at um, to raise that, to make up the difference. Um, again, there were no, um, no concrete plans at all in terms of how that money would be specifically used. There were no concrete promises or very few. Um, there's the 75% going to chronically uh, homeless, uh, services for chronically homeless people. But other than that, there was very little um, specific commitment made to voters. In hindsight, was it a mistake to go forward in May, 2020? Overall, my executive leadership experience and style has taught me to never shy away from a difficult issue. It wasn't about not doing it. It was how to do it. I, I weighed the political, financial, and technical risks to the region. I know exactly what level of risk I'm taking on behalf of the people, the organization, the council, and myself. But in the end, the answer for me was to weigh the risk in favor of the people and not myself. If I and the Metro Council had not moved forward with the SHS, when we did, the risk to the region would have been much greater and people would be asking us now, why did we not take advantage of that opportunity when it was presented? Because if we had not moved when we did, we would be 18 to 24 months further behind on this issue. So you're saying if you had not, if you had gone in November as advocates originally asked for, as opposed to May, that would have set you behind another 18 to 24 months? What I'm saying is that we were able to accelerate this. We accelerated the services on the ground by going in May. But if, the money it, didn't either. It's either an emergency or it's not an emergency. And I think it's an emergency. And I think that's that's. But where the money I... didn't start flowing until July, 2021. And it would have been even further in advance of that. And why would that be? Actually, the money did not start flowing in July of 2021 through the tax revenue collection. That's actually not until this, this year. The, the counties actually forwarded themselves the money. So how did it buy you time then? It got us going faster. So if this had passed in November, couldn't counties have then forwarded themselves the, the money in just the same? It would, be, it, would, it would have been another six months out. We would be coming out of a pandemic and we would have just been starting the services this next year. Okay, I'm having trouble following the logic, but um, I understand and, and we can move on. Um, I would like to talk about, um, uh, actually, Alyssa, let me ask you this. Um, you noted in your response to our questionnaire that the metro area is short 48,000 housing mm -hmm. units. Um, and you say public investment alone isn't going to close that gap. 
what do you think Metro could be doing to spur private development of housing? And do you think that that should involve changing a significant change to the urban growth boundary? Um, yeah, and before I touch on that, I think what I'd like to comment on the decision for the homeless service bond and when that went, I think it was clear that that decision was so that the transportation bond would be on its own in November, and that was the decision making behind that. Um, so I think that needs to be considered as why that decision making was and be transparent about that calculation. So regarding now moving to the 48,000 um, units um, that's being noted on the Echo Northwest as another study says it's 50, it's probably even larger than that. I think um, Metro plays an important role again in thinking about the broader, broader region. Where are all of these units gonna go? And I would say it's a, to answer your question directly, I would be open to looking at expanding the urban growth boundary as long as we have exhausted all that we can do within the urban growth boundary. So I think we've seen plenty of commentary um, from the private sector residents that that developers are struggling right now getting housing built in the city of Portland because of inclusionary zoning and the permitting issues. I think that's important to look at from a regional perspective and Metro's perspective, because we, we've built this region um, with the understanding with the urban growth boundary that we're going to go up, right? That's kind of the, you know, we have our core, we have our town centers, and that's great. And that's a great model. But right now, City of Portland isn't holding to that model and it's pushing out on the region. I mean, you could also say that's because of remote work and other factors. But I think as a region, we need to come together and say, look, we need to maximize development as much as possible to make sure we're building that urban form as we all desire, because that's a critical way of mitigating climate change. So I think that that would be one method, right, is looking at what are we doing with zoning barriers? How do we get those out of the way and build as, as efficiently as we can? And this isn't new for Metro. I mean, if we think back to the 90s, flipping that, we, they went into the suburbs and said, you can't build cul-de-sacs, so you got to connect your streets. So this is not new territory for Metro, right? They've always weighed in and how do we build the region as best as possible? So I think that would be one core way of Metro coming to the table and looking at the regional perspective of housing. And then what we need to do, again, is bring the private sector to the table. We that they're the ones who are building, those are the ones we need to listen to. And where are those barriers? And they will tell you it's permitting and develop and infrastructure costs. So how do we get strategic as a region to invest in those areas? You know, and one example specifically is Happy Valley and Gresham going into Southeast area of, urban, of the urban growth boundary. How is Metro working with them collaboratively to make sure that planning is in place and we're getting that housing built and also looking at other areas? So I think Metro could play a much more proactive role in terms of bringing people to the table and looking ahead. And I would advocate, finally, these conversations need to be going now. It is going to be a disaster if we have the UGB expansion discussion in two years and the only way the private sector is engaging is at hearings. It's way too late. We need to be having those conversations now, building trust between Metro staff and local jurisdictions and developers to see we all need to come together to build this community. Great, thank you. Um, Lynn, can you address kind of the same question? I guess what has or should Metro be doing to spur private development and to, to close that gap in the number of available, available units? Yeah, thanks. It's a really good question and uh, that's, uh, Proactively, uh, myself and the Metro Council have uh, recognized two main things here. And that is obviously the affordability of our region. Housing prices are too high and our median wages are too low, right? And we need to figure out a way over the next five to 10 years to bring that back into balance so that we're not pushing people out into the far hinterlands of uh, Hood River County, as well as Salem, as well as uh, New Merc McMinnville. We need to be able to keep people here so that they can have easy access to jobs, house, uh, jobs, um, <clears throat> school and uh, healthcare, right? So uh, one of the things that we've proactively done, Councillor Lewis and I uh, sent a letter asking impact because we, by charter can't direct them, um, our land use uh, advisory committee, but we did ask them to start work on several things. 
uh, this year, including a map of all potential safe park, safe camp areas within the entirety of the region to help with a supportive housing service measure, not just in the city of Portland. Um, and then also to look at what, what things uh, could cities be doing differently, best practices on both the permitting and uh, things like SDCs and, and permitting fees. Uh, the, the home that I live in is actually a mother-in-law cottage or an ADU um, on our property in Lake Oswego. And uh, through my experience, Mayor Buck, who was on city council at the time, uh, learned all of the things that I was learning about how costly it was to build uh, a mother-in-law cottage to get that density, um, to be able to have a, a multi-generational family situation right here. Um, and it was, it was incredibly expensive to do. And a lot of people cannot afford to do that. And so the Lake, city of Lake Oswego has reduced their SDCs, their system development charges because of that learning process um, that a lot of the cities are going through, but we need to have it done faster and we need the best practices out there. So that's the first thing is the impact uh, of the elected officials in the region. We've asked them to start work on that and they're coming back to us with a work plan uh, very, very soon. The second is that we have a big decision coming up with the urban growth boundary in two years, and we've already started work on this. Uh, we, <laughs> a lot of work has started already, um, including it's not just residential land, but as I said, we're very engaged in the conversation about how do we bring up, there we go, bring up the, um, the medium, median wages in this region, which means that we need to attract more family wage jobs to the region or grow more family wage jobs in the region right here at home. So we've already started and we're on our third, going on our fourth panel of um, industrial land, employment land experts. Um, OBI has presented, NAP has presented, uh, GPI has presented, and we, we're gathering the information now and starting those partnerships to look at what would an urban growth boundary expansion look like for employment land and residential land, but also what do we need to do inside the urban growth boundary to maximize the utility of the land that we already have. And to that end, we have so many different planning grants that we have given to uh, cities like the city of Tiger that have done a fabulous job with their mid cycle review urban growth boundary expansion uh, request and that request is on the table right now for our COO to provide us a recommendation. Uh, her recommendation uh, is coming out very soon um, and we are looking at, at ways to partner with the city of Tiger um, on making that happen because they've done such a fabulous job on their affordable housing on their planning on their employment lands. So it's, it's planning grants like that and partnerships to get things ready, because really that's what we're about is the readiness, right, of this region to take advantage of opportunities. And so that's, that's a lot of what we're doing right now and getting ready for something that's a decision that's two years away. Great, thank you. Um, along those same lines, uh, there was a lot of uh, concern when Intel announced that it was going to be opening its two new factories in Ohio and that Oregon wasn't even on the list for consideration. Um, so I, I appreciate kind of what's being done now to look ahead, but I mean, could it be that that Metro is is late on this? I mean, should it have um, been doing more, not just, I mean, Intel, because that's its own set of circumstances, but um, just uh, to support manufacturers and economic growth um, even before this. Sorry, I've got a skylight that's creating. Problems. Okay, no problem. <laughs> I'll just turn around. Um, you know, past uh, conversations about the urban growth boundary, um, you know, I'll leave it to those who, uh, good gravy, the sun <laughs> out in Oregon. What, what the heck? Um, you know, I think uh, what we've done is try to make sure that uh, we are maximizing what's inside the urban growth boundary as well as how we grow, right? And it's been really difficult over the years and, and there have been attempts, but I think this is the moment where we can shine because of that one uh, decision by Intel to basically not look at Oregon, right? We weren't even on the playing field. And the reason we weren't even on the playing field is because we have none of the tools in this state to help a major metropolitan area attract or grow new jobs within, um, within the major metropolitan area. We don't have the, the types of tax incentives and programs. 
We don't have the infrastructure programs um, from water to sewer to transportation. We have not made transportation investments in this region for over 40 years. So if we're gonna actually get on the playing field, there's a whole lot of things that need to happen at the state level in order to help our cities. Metro doesn't have the authority to create those programs, tax incentives. Metro has some authority to do what we, we try to do and we're learning from, from the transportation um, ballot measure, but it's not at the same level that the state can help out with. Um, all of these things are, are gonna need to be looked at and that's why I'm so excited to be on the Silicon Manufacturing Task Force because it's not just about finding the 1,000 acre site in the state to go and you know, try and, and uh, uh, attract that kind of growth to our state. It's actually, as Intel pointed out when they, when they presented in the first meeting, it's about the 50 acre, it's about the 100 acre, it's about the 200 acre that we already have or we could include at the edge of the urban growth boundary, but we have to make sure that we have the resources to make sure land is ready right? It's not ready right now. And that means that Clackamas County can't go out and attract and grow business. It means that Gresham can't go out and attract business because the resources just aren't there. And that's something that you need state investment to, to right. help prepare that. Yep, this is a state partnership in a big way. And this is the way all the other states work. Okay, thank we, you. we just have never gotten on the playing field. Alyssa, what's your view about that, about either the Intel decision or if Metro was, um, or the state was caught flat-footed on this? Yeah, they were. I, I think it's too late. Once the decision's been made, um, we weren't ready. And as I led the economic development strategy that was commissioned by Metro and GPI for the four county region, it was grossly apparent that that's not where we were focusing. We tried, to get attention placed on the semiconductor industry. Elected leadership, including at Metro, has not paid attention to the importance of traded sector industry. It was really concerning throughout the development of that economic development plan. And I would challenge placing blame on the state is not appropriate. We do have a significant um, tax incentive, the SIP, the Strategic Investment Program, which is really critical for um, keeping Intel here. And I think what's important to think about, we get focused on land, but if you look at those articles focusing on the Intel decision and knowing this from talking to site selectors and recruiting companies here, the two other factors, I mean, if we were just to look at land, Intel be in Western Kansas, right? That's not your only issue. The critical issue is if you look at that, the amount of in, in, um, investment and commitment the governor and lieutenant governor made. Political leadership matters in terms of conveying to businesses, we care about you. We want to grow you. That's been one of the biggest problems we're seeing um, in the region right now with, with the COVID and in the businesses, especially leaving city of Portland. No one's reaching out to them. No one's saying you're critical. I spoke with, we see Pencil is leaving. If you guys saw those articles, they're the footwear design company. Dwayne, Dr. Duena Edwards started. Um, if we wanna talk about equitable economic development, one of the most critical um, organizations we have for African-American black males they were creating all of the new talent designing footwear. We met with Adidas, Nike, uh, Columbia, Keen. All they said was, we want more pencils, we want more pencils. He is leaving, going to Detroit and starting one of the first shoe manufacturing facilities in the country. That should be happening to here. I reached out to Dr. Edwards. I said, what can we do? How do we get you come back? He's like, I'll talk to you in two years. Thank you for talking to me. You are the only person who has talked to me. This is what we are missing in our elected leadership is the understanding and respect for business. So that is the other component, land, political engagement and appreciation of business. And the third one is talent. So Intel, we are so incredibly fortunate because it is the R&D hub of Intel. We have all the brilliant talent creating the new innovation and then it's replicated in Arizona and New Mexico and in the new Ohio facility. We have got to keep that. So priority number one is making sure we have the best talent in the region, which we are not doing either. Uh, I would argue the city of Portland and the region views PSU as just simply having 26,000 bodies downtown. We need to elevate that to a science and engineering technical hub to drive innovation and keep 
companies like Intel here, and then you will have the supply chain um, factor with the tier one, I mean, the tier two and the tier three companies, which need smaller acres. That's what we need to be talking about. That's what fits with the Portland model is innovation and talent, right? Supported by elected leaders. And then we can talk about the land factor as well. Great, thank you. Um, relationship with business is uh, one of the things that Alyssa, you talked about in um, the questionnaire regarding the failure of the transportation bond. Mm -hmm. What lessons should, um, would you take from the failure of the transportation bond in perhaps fashioning a new one if you were elected council president? I think obviously infrastructure is critical. I mean, everything we've been talking about, economic development, that's obviously what I do. We've got to have it to move goods and people. Um, moving forward, though, I think first and foremost, Metro has to deliver on the three bonds they're resp responsible for. The open parks, and, um, open space and parks bond, which is four hundred and seventy-five million. The affordable housing bond, six hundred and fifty million, and the two point five billion dollar homeless service bond, right? Three point six billion in total. Trust needs to be rebuilt with the constituents. Obviously, there's a breakdown in trust with the people in Fort, Port, people for Portland ballot measure right now. I what I view with that is it is just a glaring red flag that there's a breakdown. Right, we don't want to be governing by ballot measures. So one, Bet Metro needs to deliver on those bonds, right, so that the the voters will be willing to invest again. I think what's also critical going forward needs to include a sunset provision. That is why I did not vote for it. It was going to be an unending tax. Most local jurisdictions, when they go out to bond for new transportation projects, that's it. It's a limited window. It's a limited focus. I think that's appropriate to be accountable to the voters. I think what Metro also should be showing is that it's being a good steward as much as possible right now. Who is Metro partnering? You know, Metro needs to show it's partnering with local jurisdictions to go get the bipartisan federal money. There's five billion dollars of grant money for Vision Zero projects, which which would fund 82nd and 122nd projects. Of course, not all of them, but at least some of them. And you could convey that to the voters that we are going for money wherever we can. We're not just going to sit around and wait for another regional transportation bond. We're going to do what we can with what we can get. And then finally, of course, you have to bring the private sector to the table to build the list and develop the taxing structure. So with those four factors in place, um, I think there's an opportunity to go forward with another transportation measure. Great, thank you. Um, Lynn, what about you? What are the, the lessons you take from the failure of the transportation bond, which, which was one of your top priorities? Yeah, it was and still is uh, because it is uh, a huge part of the economic development of this region. So uh, the one thing that we uh, started out after uh, the vote was we did uh, a 360 on ourselves. Uh, to find out what, what was going on. Uh, people came back and said, we loved the process by which you put together. And that was businesses as well as all of the other stakeholders uh, that were around the table. They loved the process and loved the content. They thought it was a really good package. There were tweaks that every different stakeholder would make, these small little tweaks to the side, um, but they loved all of that. Uh, where I think we got uh, crosswise was that every single one of the measures that Metro has put out, we have done the visioning process first, and then we came and did the taxing conversation. In this case, the taxing conversation fell right at, at COVID. And the conversation got stilted and it wasn't, it wasn't the perfect conversation. Um, and so that's where we would start this time when we bring it back. We need to have a really great understanding in this region um, of how do you pay for transportation in the state? Where are the opportunities? Because there are opportunities at the federal level, but most of them you cannot actually achieve unless you have a local match. We have not had a local match in any way, shape or form for the last 40 years. And it's something that, you know, Congressman, Congressman DeFazio has beat his head against a brick wall. Like we need match, otherwise I can't bring home some of these things. So a, a large amount of money will be left on the table for Oregon if this region does not find a, a way to pay for a, a local match. So uh, that's the commitment I've made to the business community is that we will come back 
And we will have that conversation about taxation first and figure out how to pay for it. Obviously in this, in this region, a lot of uh, the history of taxation got us to a point where we were overly relying on property tax when there was a pushback because there was too much property tax increase. Jurisdictions then started going to a business tax. The business taxes got too high. This was, this was the moment when they said, this is, we've had enough, this is it. Um, so I, I think that's what we've learned from this. And the business community has been very happy that we will bring it back, A, that the content in general was solid. Now the question is how, how to pay for it. And that's gonna be a hard conversation because in other states, as um, many of us know on this call, uh, those regions use sales tax at the local level in order to come up with their local match. Um, the only other option that people put out last time that we did not pursue is a vehicle miles traveled tax, which is where the state had been heading. Do we ask for the authority to do that? So there'll be a lot of conversations about the taxation coming up, um, but it'll be really important because we do want to take advantage of the federal money and we do want to take advantage of this moment where the region is laser focused on those 13 corridors from the transportation measure. It is the first time that we have actually had that kind of Unit, unit, unanimous support for what we need to do in the region. And I'll just remind us all that the first regional parks bond measure failed as well. Um, and we came back and talked to the region and they said, here's what we would like to change from the first one. And it passed and we've had this amazing, amazing opportunity in this region to build out a regional park system. Uh, Austin mayor told me the next day, uh, he said, don't worry, it took us three times to get it right on transportation. I said, no, 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 I just one more. We, we got to get it right the next time. And uh, Seattle took 13 times to get their light, their light rail up and running as a system. So I think we're, act we're actually doing transportation is just really hard. It's a hard topic. And I'm, I'm glad that we, we learned a lot and we'll move forward. I guess one of the questions I have is, is why would the funding mechanism be the last part of the conversation? I mean, doesn't that kind of show a, a lack of concern or um, uh, just in terms of the people who are being asked to pay for it? Well, it's worked in the past until this one. And so now is the time to look at that methodology. Um, Great, thank you. I, I wanna stay on the subject of transportation, specifically talk about congestion pricing. And um, Lynn, can you talk about what your stance is on congestion pricing and specifically uh, whether you would support a toll on, you know, starting with a toll on I-205 um, at the Abernathy Bridge or that segment? Um, yes, the, the clear answer is yes, I support the tolling. Um, the state, is obviously in a deficit as it comes to transportation investment, 40 years of nothing um, really being invested in our roadways uh, or a bus system. We've done a great job on light rail, but we need to do a better job at all of it. Um, so the, the toll in order to pay for the Abernathy project, just like every, you know, almost every state in the union is headed towards congestion pricing and tolling because the gas tax is losing its ability to actually be a pay as you, pay as you use the system kind of tax. Um, it, on one hand, it's great because we all wanted more fuel efficient cars, but that means that there's less gas tax going in as that fuel is not used, right? So for fuel, it is a fuel dependent tax, then then we are on a literally a, a narrowing road to nowhere. <laughs> so uh, we have to find other ways to do it. And this, this is one of, of those ways. Now the entirety of the, the bridge is not being paid by tolls, but a portion of it is being paid by tolls. I think it's a good step as we move forward, but what we need to do is make sure we protect the communities that live uh, and work and play along those corridors where we put up tolling or congestion pricing because there's gonna be diversion. You know, I oversaw the, the entirety of the tolling program for the state of Washington um, when I was secretary of the Department of Transportation. And it was just a, one of the ways we did business was to work with the communities to talk about what, what were gonna be the diversionary impacts onto the local streets. And then how do you pay for improvements to make sure that those streets are safe and functioning well for the community. That hasn't happened yet. And that's something that Metro Council is gonna be discussing tomorrow. Uh, 
asking ODOT to make commitments in that direction. What I will say in congestion pricing, it is to me the single most important thing that we can do in this region to manage our demand um, during peak hours to reduce GHG emissions and pay for our infrastructure and pay for parallel routes, right? The diversionary impacts. We need to do a better job on managing our demand in total um, in order to be able to accommodate the growth of trips in the region. And that's why I've been endorsed by everybody from the Street Trust to the Oregon League of Conservation Voters, Building Power for Communities of Color, business leaders, firefighters, teachers, realtors, labor unions, and 20 mayors across the region, because it is, it is a moment like this where you have to show the leadership and get the outcomes that everybody is asking for. And this is one of those hard decisions that we're gonna to need to make. Uh, and we're gonna to need to make sure that ODOT is doing it in a way, the OTC is doing it in a way, the state legislature is doing it in a way that benefits our communities, not just those traveling through the region. Thank you. Um, Alyssa, what is your view on congestion pricing and specifically the 205 toll? Um, I think what's important to look at, um, I'm, I'm not, a, I'm, a, I'm a very supportive of congestion pricing um, and including tolls. I'm not in favor of how this is being handled right now. And I think we need to step back and I'm listening to a lot of this conversation and President Peterson is talking about a lot of problems, but we're not talking about how she is going to solve them. And I think back, I'd like to comment on her management of the tolls. If you look at the reporting in the Seattle Times, According to the residents living in those communities, the, the tolling process was a fiasco. So I think that needs to be considered in terms of a record. I think the concern is what is coming in is ODOT is asking for an amendment to the regional transportation plan. It's a five-year plan and they're asking to insert the project now. If congestion pricing is so critical, which I believe it is, and President Peterson has an, this extensive experience in engineering, why wasn't this being addressed years ago? coming to the table. I know the RTP was addressed in 2018, but why didn't we start addressing it years ago? If we need alternative financing, instead of taxing all of our business for our infrastructure, why didn't we bring congestion pricing to the table? That's the kind of visionary leadership we need to take. Right now, what we're, what we're dealing with is ODOT coming in one specific project with some tolls. The community is livid because of the diversion issue. And we're just letting ODOT come in and control our regional transportation system. That is not how Metro should be leading. Metro needs to be leading and looking at the entire system and pushing back on ODOT and say, why all of a sudden now? Let's hold off. Let's do this right and make sure the community is on board. That's what I think needs to be happening at Metro. Let's take a leadership position. If we do do, do congestion pricing, let's do it region wide. And that's where I have some concerns with the current leadership and how we're addressing all issues at Metro. Everything's a reaction. We're not planning. And so that's the shift we need to be taking and moving forward, solving problems and leading our region instead of reacting to issues that come forward. If I may. Sure. Obviously my opponent has not been paying attention to what the Metro Council has been doing. And that is leading on this issue. We have had extensive conversations with values, outcomes and actions documents that we have sent to ODOT that have had folks sign on to in terms of here's where we believe we need to go and this is what we need from you ODOT. We are holding ODOT accountable to those as well as the I-5 bridge project. So I would encourage that you read those values, outcome and action documents and say, if that is not reactionary, that's actually proactive. And are you getting and, and, response and, uh, from I, ODOT? I mean, is ODOT responding and providing what you're asking for? Are they providing plans for what's gonna happen if you have um, diversionary impacts of, of a toll on 205? Yes, they will be, they will be responding to us on Thursday. And I would just like to add in terms of developing those values, again, back to this reaction, they were developed in real time in a hearing, deciding if Metro was gonna allocate $36 million for the I-5 bridge project. They were redlining values in a public hearing that same day. That is not leading, that is reacting. If you're gonna establish values and make sure that you are pushing ODOT, I would challenge that should have been done months in advance, not in real time in a public hearing. 
Great, thank you. Um, we are about out of time. I did want to ask briefly about open spaces in terms of whether, um, uh, and if we can do this actually really quickly, that, that would be great. But um, uh, let's start with you, Alyssa. And I guess I'm wondering, do you feel that there is adequate public um, access to and uh, opportunity for, uh, to use public spaces or open spaces that have been purchased by Metro, um, as well as whether Metro has been executing on its bond um, to, to provide more opportunities for the public? No, I mean, I, I think the recent article, and you saw that with the, probably with the Willamette Week, is an incredible example of how Metro has owned a property since 1996 right and it's contaminated and it's been sitting there obviously well for 26 years and looking back um, at metro the opportunity that they haven't even applied for a brownfield grant they've applied for brownfield field grants along mclaughlin corridor city of tiger and other communities but not specifically on willamette cove so that alone seems like they're not even looking at opportunities from other federal, federal funding to move this project forward. I understand. I work closely on brownfield projects. I know they're complicated. So let's get the assessments coming in. Let's get EPA brownfield grants looking at that park. And then you can be using your park dollars to be investing um, in the design and implementation. So no, I, I think what's really compelling about Willamette Cove is you have people ranging from Bob Salinger of the Audubon Society with John Charles at the Cascade Policy Institute saying, get Willamette Cove done. Instead, Metro has been spending time um, and they own the property. It, it, they can control it and they can take care of it. Instead, they've been focused on projects like Willamette Falls where they have no control. And we saw where the Willamette Falls project has gone. So no, I do not think Metro is appropriately implementing their open space bond and leading forward with what the community is desiring for. Again, let's listen to what the community wants instead of focusing on um, personal um, agendas and projects. Thank you. Um, and Lynn, same question for you. I mean, do you think Metro is delivering for the public on opportunities to access these open spaces? Uh, yes, in a big way. Uh, and I, I can attest to the fact that I came in and wanted to make sure that we were actually opening up access to lands we already have. And that is part of the uh, 2019 parks and open space bond measure is that prior administrations had bought a lot of land and not provided access and now we're going to be able to with capital projects get the parking lot get the the restroom get the trail system built and Chehalem Ridge Park and Newell Creek Canyon are are examples of of how we are moving forward on that promise uh, specifically with the Willamette Cove uh, again, I can't speak on behalf of prior administrations who did not prioritize this project. All I can say is that we did. As a council, we prioritized it because we did go and listen to the community about what their needs, wants, desires were. And this became a priority for the council because we listened. Um, and what we needed to do is first wait for a DEQ uh, decision, which has been made now and we can proceed forward. Uh, and then we needed, we don't have a plan with the community. So that's what we're in development on now is what is the plan for how this land will be used since it is a brownfield and figuring out what the active uses um, versus passive uses will be because there is still uh, some question about how, how toxic it is down there and how much work needs to be done to get it to active versus passive. And I think that's a really important conversation to have with the community uh, before we start spending any money. And how long do you think that's going to take? Well, I mean, tr <laughs> uh, planning processes are kind of, you know, 12, 18, 24 months. It depends on uh, the community and uh, coming out of COVID, it's been difficult, right, to get people. But now that we're coming out of COVID, we should be able to accelerate some of this stuff. Great. Thank you both for making so much time available. This was a great conversation. Um, so I, I really appreciate it. Um, if we have any further questions, I will follow up with you individually. I think at this point, we're thinking about coming out with our endorsement a week from this coming Wednesday. So uh, about almost two weeks, uh, actually, I guess two weeks. Um, so since today is Wednesday, I lose track of that. Um, but thank you again, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you both.